Hello, my name's Jake Hapgood, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of Sumo Digital's game development tutorials for beginners. Like everybody else, we've had to get used to spending much more time at home recently. Yet we are incredibly lucky in the games industry, because we can carry on doing the jobs we love from our own homes. So we thought, why not share the love by making some tutorials to help anyone make video games in their own homes too. We would never have created these resources so quickly without piggybacking on the amazing work of the Spider team, so a massive shout out to the team for that. All of our tutorials are going to be based on the antics of the game's main character Agent 8 and the cool retro universe that he occupies. But before we can make a start, you'll need to download and install Game Maker Studio 2 from the YoYo Games website. This is the software we'll be using for these tutorials, as it's very easy for beginners to get to grips with. You'll need an email address to register for an account, but it won't cost you anything to get started with it. I suggest you pause the video now and come back when you've done that. OK, so let's talk about our game's design. We're going to keep things really simple with our first game. The setting clearly needs to place Agent 8 in a tricky situation, but the easiest games to make are typically ones where things just float around the screen, that way the interactions between objects stay pretty simple. So we're going to put Agent 8 dangling from a wire on the left hand side of the screen and have obstacles flying towards him from the right. Agent 8 doesn't normally have the ability to drop from a wire like this, but we'll say he's had an upgrade for the purposes of this mission and that upgrade includes a big laser gun on his back too. To help justify lots of flying obstacles, there'll be a giant desk fan on the right hand side which is so powerful it's blowing everything into the player's path. Agent 8 will have to survive by dodging or shooting the dangerous objects, but we'll add some things in there for him to collect, so we'll need to avoid destroying those in the process. We're going to call our game idea Spywire, alluding towards the wire that's playing a central role in this concept. So it's finally time to start creating our game, but you'll want to download a couple more things first. All the steps to create this game are available as a document. I'm only going to take you through the first part of that process in this video, so you'll need the document to complete the game. You're also going to probably want to download the spider-themed graphics, music and sound effects for the tutorial, although you could obviously make your own if you prefer. You'll find instructions on how to download all of these things in the video's description. When you start up Game Maker Studio 2 for the first time, it looks a bit like this. We'll start by selecting New to create a new project for our game. Game Maker actually provides two different approaches for making games. The first is a visual programming system based on dragging and dropping icons. The second is a more traditional scripting language called Game Maker Language, or GML for short. We're going to select Drag and Drop as it's a great place for beginners to start. We need to give our new project a name and we're going to call this one Spywire. So type that in and hit Save. Game Maker will then set up our project ready for us to begin. So this is Game Maker's main window. It's all rather empty at the moment, but on the right hand side you can see all the different resources that make up a game. There's not much to see yet, but all the resources will appear here as we add them to the project. We're going to begin by creating a new sprite resource. In Game Maker, the images that make up the game are called sprites. You can create these yourself in an art package, but we've created some for you as part of the Spider resource pack. So using the right mouse button, right click on the Sprite section of the resources and choose Create Sprite from the menu that appears. This will cause a new Sprite properties form to appear in the workspace. Now click on the name field where it currently says Sprite 0. This is the default name created by GameMaker for our new Sprite, but you should rename it SPR underscore Agent 8. Always avoid using punctuation or spaces in names of resources, as it can create problems later on. It's conventional to use the underscore symbol instead of spaces, which is usually found on the minus key on your keyboard. Press shift and the minus key to get your underscore. Next, click on the import button, which will open the standard Windows file requester. Now you'll need to navigate your way to the resources archive you downloaded earlier and find the Agent 8 sprite. Click on the open button, and ignore the message that appears about importing files. I've chosen to enable the Don't Show This Message Again checkbox as well. The grey checkerboard shows which areas of the sprite are transparent. 
and you can see there are four frames of animation in the sprite. If we press the play button, then we can see what that animation looks like. Now's probably a good time to talk about coordinates in GameMaker. The position of things in GameMaker is determined by coordinates. The X coordinate determines horizontal position, and the Y coordinate determines vertical position. This is all pretty standard stuff that you will have covered in school, except that the Y coordinate increases going down the screen. This means that the point x equals 0, y equals 0 is actually in the top left, not the bottom left. And that's an important thing to remember about coordinates in GameMaker. If you look really carefully, you can see that the coordinate 0, 0 is marked in the top left of the sprite. And it controls the point from which the sprite is manipulated in the game. It's not always necessary to change this, but in this case we can use it to mark the position from which things will appear on the sprite like the wire or the laser. You can change the origin simply by clicking on the sprite. Click somewhere around where the red X appears. This will then update the origin accordingly, but it's very easy to accidentally click on the sprite again and change it, so I also recommend clicking on the lock icon to prevent it being edited unintentionally. While we're here, we're also going to change the speed of our sprite to 3 frames per second as it looks better that way. OK, that's your first sprite. You can click on the X button to close down the Sprite Properties form. So now we're going to do a very similar thing for the next sprite, except that this time we're going to use the Create Sprite from Image option. This has the advantage of saving us a few clicks by automatically opening up the File Requester to import our sprite. This time find the Fan image and name the sprite SPR underscore Fan. Note that we're renaming it from the resource list, which is another way of doing it. This time we're going to set the sprite's origin to its middle center from the drop down menu and then we can close the sprite as we're done with it. We're now repeating the process for all the remaining sprites in the game. Each one takes its name from the name of the file and has its origin set to the middle center. Here's the full list of sprites and their names. You might want to pause the video here and catch up. OK, so sprites don't do anything on their own. They just store pictures of different elements of the game. Objects are the parts of the game that control how these elements move around and react to each other. So we'll begin by creating our first object to tell GameMaker how the fan will behave. Creating a new object works in a very similar way to creating a new sprite. Simply right click on the Object section of the resources and select Create Object. This time an Objects Properties form will appear attached to an Events window. More about those in a moment, but first we need to give our object a sensible name. Call this one obj underscore fan. Then click on the three little dots next to where it says no sprite and select the fan sprite from the list that appears. Right, now let's talk about events. GameMaker uses events and actions to determine how objects should behave. Events are important things that happen in the game, such as when two objects collide or when the player presses a key on the keyboard. Actions are things that happen in response to an event, such as changing an object's direction, setting the score, or playing a sound. GameMaker games are basically just a collection of objects with actions to tell them how they should react to different events. Therefore, to set the behaviour of an object in GameMaker, you must define which events the object should react to and what actions they should perform in response. The fan object's list of events and actions is currently empty. We'll begin with an event and action that will make the fan move up the screen at the start of the game. This will be complemented by an event and action that will reverse the vertical direction when it comes into contact with the edge of the screen. As a result, the fan will move continually up and down between the top and the bottom of the screen. Click on the Add Event button and select the Create Event. As its name suggests, the create event is triggered just once when the fan is first created. This now brings up the actions window for the create event. This is currently empty, but you can see the action icons in the toolbox on the right hand side. The first action we need to include is the move direction fixed action from the movement section. To find it, you can either scroll down the list of icons or type move into the search list. When you've located it, click and hold on the action icon with the left mouse button and drag it into the actions list. 
select the up arrow to make it move in an upward direction. Now drag in a second action from the movement section called set speed. Leave type set to direction, the direction we just set, and set speed to 8. This will make the object move 8 pixels vertically for every step that it takes in the game. Now we'll add a second event for the fan object. Click on the add event button, choose other from the event menu and select intersect boundary. The event is then added and automatically selected in the list of events. Now include the reverse action in the list of actions for this event. You'll find this in the movement section with the others. Nothing needs changing on this action, so we can close the object for now by clicking on the X button on the object's properties. OK, all good so far then. Next, we're going to create the Agent 8 object for the player to control. Create it in the usual way, calling it obj underscore agent 8 and assigning it the appropriate sprite. We're now going to add a key down event, which is triggered for as long as a key is held down on the keyboard. This first one's going to check the up arrow key, so we choose up from the menu. Now include our favourite set direction fixed action in the actions list and select the upward direction arrow. Include a set speed action with type set to direction and speed set to 12. Now repeat these steps to add a key down event for the down arrow key that sets the speed downwards to 36. Spiders often seem to be able to move down on a thread much faster than they can climb up, so this adds a bit of character to the player's controls. Finally, we're going to add a no key event to stop Agent 8 moving when no buttons are being pressed on the keyboard. This time, we only need to add a set speed action setting the speed to zero, as his direction doesn't affect anything when he's not moving. We can now close the Agent 8 object for the time being. So now would be a really good time to talk about the difference between object resources and instances of those objects in the game. It may help to think of an object as a bit like a jelly mould. The mould defines the shape of the jelly, but you can make any number of jellies using the same mould. So although there obviously is only one Agent 8, there's nothing stopping you creating a hundred instances of your Agent 8 object in your game. It just might be a bit difficult to control. So let's go ahead and create some instances of our objects in our game. Rooms are a bit like levels in GameMaker, and GameMaker automatically creates the first room in your game for you. So you just need to double click on the room resource to open it up. Before you can add instances, you need to make sure that you have the instances layer selected in the top left hand corner of the room editor. With this highlighted, you can simply drag objects into the room to create instances of those objects. Instances can be repositioned by dragging them somewhere else or deleted by pressing the delete key. Before we start placing instances properly, we're going to change the size of our room. Under the room settings, set the width to be 1280 pixels and the height to be 720 pixels. Next, click on the center fit button in the top right to make our entire room fit in the viewing area. Now you can carefully place instances of the two objects at opposite sides of the room taking care that the fan object doesn't intersect the boundary of the room, otherwise its events won't work properly. You can now save your project by clicking on the disk icon and test your game by clicking on the run button or pressing the F5 key on your keyboard. Here's what my game looks like, but I bet you couldn't resist placing a few more Agent 8s. Good luck controlling those in the final game. Close the game window to return to GameMaker or press the stop button on the toolbar. Congratulations on making it this far, you're well on the way to making the full game. You'll need to follow the rest of the instructions on the worksheet you downloaded to complete the game, but we'll see you back here afterwards for a few extra hints and tips on how to improve your game. Good luck! And welcome back. Hopefully you now have a working game and have learnt a lot more about GameMaker in the process. You should be starting to become more familiar with terminology like sprites, objects, events and actions, as well as starting to appreciate the difference between an object resource and instances of that object that appear in your game. If there was one other thing that I'd like you to take away from the first tutorial, it would be that actions don't just have to apply to the object that they're in. A good example of this was in the Tools object as shown here. The first Destroy Instance action applies to the other object in the collision. 
in this case the laser. However, the set score action applies to the Agent 8 object, and the final destroy instance action applies to self, in this case the tool. These are all different ways of applying actions that are useful in different situations. So I've added a number of additional features to my version of the game. I can't go through them all here now, but I will point out a couple which may be useful to you. I don't like the way that the tools disappear instantly at the moment. It feels like the laser should make them disintegrate in some way instead. So in the same way that we created a separate dead object for Agent 8, we can achieve a disintegration effect by creating a separate dead tools object. Here's one I made earlier. Two of the events are identical to the existing tools object, that is, outside room and intersect boundary. The step event just needs one additional action to set the instance alpha. This affects the transparency of the object's sprite, and reducing the instance alpha makes it appear more transparent. Note that I've also used a different version of the tool sprite, which is coloured completely white. Before this will have any effect, we'll need to change the collision event in obj tools, removing the destroy instance action that destroyed the tool, and replacing it with a change instance action into the dead tool instead. It's also worth making a couple of tweaks to the collision masks in the game to make the game more playable. Generally speaking, when collision masks are too big, players feel they've been unfairly treated, as collisions can happen in situations where they feel it shouldn't have occurred. Therefore, I've manually reduced the size of the collision masks for both the tools object and Agent 8. This makes the game easier to play and less frustrating. So let's take one final look at our finished game. Hopefully you'll agree that this adds something extra to our game, and you could use a similar approach to do the same thing for the coins, or add some stars like I've done here. Anyway, we really hope you've enjoyed making your first game, and that you'll join us again next time for the second tutorial in our series. Bye for now.